the gospel for uh, the sixth Sunday in Easter is a continuation of the previous Sunday, John chapter 16, verses, uh, verses 23 to 33. And we will begin by looking at it in, in, in the, we'll read it in the English, and then looking at it in the Greek. In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly I say to you, if you ask anything of me, he will give it to you in my, my name. Hitherto you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. I have said this to you in figures. The hour is coming when I shall no longer speak to you in figures, but tell you plainly of the Father. And that day you will ask in my name. And I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and believe that I came from the Father. I came from the Father and have come into the world. Again I am leaving and going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly, not in a figure. Now we know that you know all things and need none to question you. By this we believe you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe him? The hour is coming and indeed has come you will be scattered every man to his home and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone for the Father is with me. I have said this to you that you may have peace in the world, that you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome uh, the world. We're going to begin at the end of this particular, uh, is there more? We're going to begin at the end of uh, the end of the pericope. Thank you. And that is, uh, verse two is a reference to what Jesus anticipates in the crucifixion. He says here, "Behold, the hour is coming and has come, and each one will be scattered, each to his own, and I will, and you will leave me alone. You will desert me." I am not alone. I am not among us alone. The Father is with me, with me. These things I spoke to you so that you could have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation and be sorrowful, but I have conquered the world. Now, this is a direct reference made by Jesus as he anticipates his own crucifixion. Uh, that we come here to this idea of being deserted by God. And that is, well, we Lutherans make a big point of the law and the gospel. And what do we, what do we mean and speak about what the law works? Um, now, how is this related to the work of Christ? Does Christ feel the kind of desperation that the law creates in those who hear it, well, I mean, after all, what is the purpose of the law? Not only to tell us that we do not meet up God's demands, but that uh, God has deserted us. Um, for those of you, um, all of our, most of our parishioners are parents, or at least they, uh, they live in situations and families, and the most difficult thing is when a child grows up, as he is growing up, he is left alone without his parents. Now, there are helicopter parents, and so maybe this does, this is no longer apropos, but helicopter parents are a new thing. But the child is taken to preschool for the first time, or he's taken to kindergarten. Now, frequently, the, the parents are not able to to handle this kind of situation and they have their own breakdowns that they're losing their child. But from the viewpoint of the child, the child is going through a transition in life from having the protection of the parents there and there he is, he or she is alone in an, an entirely new environment 
and he has to uh, do things for himself. Now that's what the law does in the place of a Christian. All of a sudden, each of us realize not only that we've broken the commandments of God, but if we really realize that we've broken the God, we have the sense that we are being deserted by God. Now from an historical perspective, the disciples are going to have a sense of being deserted. They're going to be deserted by Jesus. You know, if the ministry of Jesus was three years, some people say it was maybe longer, perhaps it was longer, they had a close bond. But now the hour of desertion is going to come. But in all of these things, in every desertion, and desertion is part of the necessary part of growing, of growing up. We desert one uh, one time in our lives for another. We desert, uh, we desert the elementary or the middle school for high school, and we desert the high school for college or the military, and then we desert all connection with our mother and father for a new life uh, with, uh, with our spouses, and then comes death. Life is always a matter of desertion and being able to cope with it. The disciples are now going to be faced with the desertion by Jesus. But what about Jesus? What does he experience? It would be, uh, he feels, he, he also knows desertion. He knows the desertion by the disciples. It says here that the easiest thing for them to do when they are confronted with the death of Jesus, the easiest thing for them to do is to go back to their homes. <laughs> let's, let's, let's use a very real example here that students who go away to college, first year of college can be very traumatic for a lot of students, a lot of kids. A lot of kids, they cannot take it. And what do they do? They, they call up the parents, the parents drive the car over, pack up the things and they go home. But without desertion, we don't grow to maturity. The disciples cannot face the desertion that Jesus brings to them. But it is only by this desertion do they go to a higher level and they begin to understand the things that Jesus had said. And it says right here, in the world you will have tribulation. Ento cosmo thilipsen ekata, you will have this. Nevertheless, rejoice, I have conquered the world. See, they're going to be an entirely, they're going to be out there by themselves. And that's not going to be easy. I suppose we could, since the people are watching, since the folks who are watching this, most of them are clergy persons, there's a kind of desertion which goes in being, assuming your first assignment as a pastor of a congregation you're being deserted, you, or you desert, doesn't matter whether you do it or whether the seminary does it, you are deserted by them or you desert them, it's the same thing, and you are left on your own. But only through the desertion do you come to a higher degree of maturity, and when you, when the person, when you attain to that maturity, the things that you feared the most then become an opportunity for great joy. Now, the first part of this pericope uh, speaks about prayer. And uh, it's, it's kind of contradictory, because in verse 23, it says, In that hour you will ask me nothing. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Now, what, what does this mean? Does this mean that up to this time, Jesus was the entire object of their requests? Uh, that whatever they, whatever they wanted of a divine nature or quality, they asked from Jesus and um, he gave it to them? Now it switches somewhat. He says, Jesus says, you will not ask, you will not ask me anymore, you will ask the Father. And he will, and he will give it to you. Is this a reference to the now what has happened that because of the death of Jesus, the barrier between God and man has been removed? And so now they come into, 
there, there is a fuller revelation of God's Trinitary existence. Uh, before the, the atonement of Jesus, Jesus uh, was accomplished and then endorsed by his resurrection, they, they did not have a direct reference, they did not have a, a access uh, to the Father. But now they are going to have to have it, an access to the Father. Now, the, there are, there's one thing that strikes me here. Is Jesus here referring to the Lord's Prayer? That now they can pray, Our Father who art in heaven, then go immediately to the Father? And when uh, the disciples say that up to this time Jesus is speaking in figures, is this possibly a reference to the parables in the Synoptic Gospels? And that uh, in the Synoptic Gospels, uh, there is no Oh, there is one. No one knows the Son but the Father, and no one knows but the Father but the Son. And uh, the scholars suspect that someone brought that passage in from John, which, of course, is not true. But in the parables of Jesus, God, or the Father, is always spoken, is always presented in parabolic term. And they say, previously, when Jesus spoke about God, he spoke in parables. The term is figure. You can say he's spoken allegorical these terms. Now that Christ is going to complete the work of atonement and be resurrected from the dead, they will be able to understand things directly. They will go from speaking in stories to into speaking in in dogmatical terms. Um, and they will be able to ask the Father whatever he uh, whatever they want. Now comes this great passage, verse twenty seven. For the Father. Uh, for the Father Himself loves you. Right over here. For the Father Himself loves you, because you have loved me right here, and you believe that I am from God. That I have come out. From God. Now this is an amazing passage for a number of reasons. First of all, it uses the word for love. It does not use um, the, uh, the, uh, the the frequently used word for love. It uses the word philawo, which is sometimes spoken of as an inferior love. But here this love philawo explains the relationship of the Son to the Father, and uh, of us to the Father. Uh, so that ought to do away with those particular sermons that speak of the three kinds of love, that filial love is uh, inferior, inferior love. Now the idea of philawo love means, uh, it, it is, has this concept of a, a love within a family. This has, this has the idea that we now come into a relationship with God that we form together one family. And uh, then in this situation, we have, see, the, 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 the challenge with the Gospel of John is this, is that in, a, in, in John, and especially in this pastor here, passage here, we are dealing with so many concepts that it becomes difficult to put them into one sermon. Uh, Jesus said that the true faith is this, that's in 27, that you believe that uh, he came from the Father. That's what we do in the creed. And there are many people who do not believe that Jesus came from God, the Father. Uh, now with the in intention given to, the, to Islam and religion, they certainly do not believe that. Uh, they do not believe in the resurrection. And um, I, I think this is a thought that completely escapes most of the most people, even religious people. He comes from the Father. Now this has a double meaning of coming from the Father. It has the meaning that Jesus' own existence as the Son is derived from the Father in a continual or a perpetual or a perpetual way. It also has the reference to the Incarnation. 
So there is the Christmas theme that I have come into the world. I have come into the world. That is that is Christmas. And I am leaving the world and going to the Father. That's the end of verse 28. And does this also have a double meaning? Within the context in which Jesus is speaking these things, his going to the Father speaks of him, of him proceeding to the Father to offer an atonement. It may also carry the idea that this will all be completed in the ascension. I go to my Father and your Father, and I ascend to your Father and to my Father. And here comes a kind of a touchy issue. Um, we're going backwards in this particular passage here. And that's in verse 23, where it says, In that day you will ask me nothing, for truly I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Now, it can just become cliché right here that every time that we offer a prayer we say in Jesus name that's a good idea but I'm not so sure it completely sanitizes the prayer uh, because there is something more profound going on because the prayer that we offer in the name of Jesus means it's the prayer that Jesus himself prays this means that we cannot pray to Jesus unless we pray his prayers and that he prays with us and that we don't have direct access to the Father, but our direct access is through Jesus, who by going to the Father has made the Father available to us. And uh, this can be the topic of a complete sermon, because in many, many shall we say, conser good conservative Christians, as broad as that category can be, when they're praying, pray in the name of God or in the name of, of the name of the Father. They leave out the concept of name. A prayer offered in the name of the Father of, or in God is totally without meaning. The, because it completely forgets this, that there is no direct access to God apart from Jesus. That is the only way in which uh, people have access to God. And uh, a lot of clergy, person, comprom uh, clergy persons compromise themselves on that. They compromise themselves on that because they don't want to offend anybody. Now, just recently in a Port Wayne newspaper, the local Iman, the Muslim Iman, had a, had, a, had, a, had a speech in there. And yeah, and part of the things he was opposed to was Judeo-Christianity, the Judeo-Christian faith, to which he said, this is a Muslim that there is no such thing as a Judeo-Christian faith. And that's absolutely right. But I have an idea that with some of us, some of our people, they actually think there is a common basis for Jewish and Christian religion. But there is no common basis. We do share the same Old Testament, but we look at it entirely different ways. Because with the coming of Christ, it is absolutely clear that he is the only way to the Father. And when we do not mention Jesus in our prayers, we compromise. What, why the hesitancy? Why the hesitancy to mention the name of, of Jesus? Now, this pericope concludes by saying that Jesus has spoken all of these words. That is in verse 13. The world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The church is in tribulation. In Pakistan, a group of Christians were killed. In, in, in our country, the church is receiving less and less protection from various liberal groups, LBGT groups. Yes, we are, this is, this is what Jesus says. This, we are living, just as Jesus was in the tribulation, just before, uh, the day before he da died. So we are now in that situation of being in tribulation. And he gives us the assurance that just as he came out of the tribulation by his resurrection, 
So we will also, by God's grace, come to the tribulation. Uh, thank you very much. And perhaps with these sections from the Gospel of John, we'll be able to perpetuate our Easter season a few more Sundays. Thank you very much.